the problem that I think we're, we're all seeing and certainly that we've kind of been growing increasingly concerned about for some time um, is that it's, it's not enough anymore that you, can ru that you can participate in a peer-to-peer -peer network and nobody can tell what, what you are doing. Increasingly, it's the case in this country and elsewhere that simply the act of participating in a peer-to-peer -peer network is in itself a pretty risky thing to do. As a result, we believe that future anonymous peer-to-peer -peer networks will need to limit who your peer connects to, to a group of trusted friends, people that you have decided you don't mind that they know that you're part of this peer-to-peer -peer network. The big question is, is it possible? And if it's possible, will it be useful? Just for, for those quickly to clarify the term peer-to-peer, -peer, because if you ask 10 people what peer-to-peer -peer means, you'll get 10 different answers. Um, from our point of view, a peer-to-peer -peer network is designed to help people find information. Specifically, it's designed to help people find information that is widely distributed across, of a, lo across a large number of computers which are connected through some network uh, in practice, typically the, the internet. Users of this system want to find information. They need to, know, uh, they need to know where the information is so that they can go out and retrieve it. There are different approaches to this. The first, uh, the first peer to peer network in many ways was, was a piece of software called Napster, and its approach was pretty simple. Uh, every peer in the network simply reported to a central server or eventually one of several central servers what, what uh, data was, was being stored on that computer. And so if you wanted to find some data, you'd go to the central server and say, you know, where's this thing? And it would give, give you a list of computers where you could find it and you would then connect to those computers directly and retrieve it. Uh, Subsequent to that, when Napster and similar systems were being shut down, because of course a centralized system is very easy to shut down, uh, people started working on what we call semi-centralized peer-to-peer networks, where it's essentially the same idea, but instead of one centrally administered index of data, um, you have a large number of of decentralized indexes. So when you connect to the network, you're allocated one or more of these indexes, and you use that pretty much like a, a mini Napster. Uh, Kazaz is probably the archetypal example of that approach. Uh, sub, well, other peer-to-peer -peer networks strive to be completely decentralized, such that, in essence, each peer in the network does pretty much the same job and has loosely the same degree of responsibility as every other peer in the network, and Freenet is one of several examples of peer-to-peer of -peer networks like that. Another way that you can classify peer-to-peer -peer networks, and it's particularly useful for the purposes of, of our talk, is into light and dark. Examples of light peer-to-peer -peer networks, or you could also call them promiscuous peer-to-peer -peer networks, uh, include Nutella, Freenet, distributed hash tables, indeed the vast majority of peer-to-peer -peer networks that you've probably heard of. Um, in essence, light peer a light peer-to-peer -peer network is defined by the fact that your computer will willingly connect to strangers, which means that strangers, people you don't know or trust, can discover that you are running the software. The advantage of this is that if you do it right, uh, it can be globally scalable, uh, which essentially means whether you have 100,000 users or 100 million users, you can still find information pretty efficiently. The disadvantage is it's vulnerable to harvesting. If someone, if someone wanted, if, for example, the Chinese government wanted to get a nice convenient list of all of, of, all of the people in China that were running Freenet, they could do that. It wouldn't necessarily be easy, but it would certainly be possible. This, when we first came up with the idea, we didn't really uh, see this as, well, 
this wasn't really on our radar, but over the past few years we've realized that it's not only an increasing threat in countries like China, but also in this country. I think most people here are probably familiar with, with uh, uh, recent court decisions which have further rolled back the, the freedom of people to share information uh, in the ways that they might want to do. The alternative to this are dark or you can also call them friend-to-friend peer-to-peer networks. These networks are characterized by the fact that peers in this network only talk to other peers directly, only establish a direct line of communication with other peers that they trust, that their user trusts. So the user is saying, I don't mind that these people know that I'm part of this network. An example of this is a piece of software called Waste. The advantage of this as, as I said, is that only your friends know that you're part of the network. The disadvantage is that until now, this type of network ten, really doesn't scale. Typically, you might have 10, you, you have isolated pockets of perhaps 5 to 10 people. And while some people have found that to be a useful thing, clearly there's a big difference between that and being part of a global network with millions of users. Shifting gears a little bit, um, networks like Freenet in completely decentralized networks rely on something called the small, small world phenomenon in order to find information in this completely decentralized way. Some of you, uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the small world concept it, or you may also be familiar with the game of Kevin Bacon where you try to get from any one act from Kevin Bacon to any one actor just by going through movies they've been in. Um, a, so, yes, yeah, so a guy called Stanley Milgram in the 1960s did a very interesting sociolog sociological experiment where he wrote the names of two people, uh, of a number of people actually, in Cambridge, Massachusetts on some letters and gave them just to random people spread throughout the United States with the instructions that they were to try to get these letters to the, to the intended recipients, but only by giving them to someone they personally knew who themselves would give it to someone else they personally knew. And very, very interestingly, uh, he found that when those letters arrived, they did so in perhaps, five, they went through just five or six people. So that's five or six people in a country of 270 million odd people clearly a very, a very scalable way to get something from where it is to where you want it to be. And interestingly, also completely decentralized. These people were not relying on any central phone directory in order to figure out where they should route this information. They were doing it purely on the basis of, of their friends. So what, what characterizes a small world network? Well, Typically, in, in, small, in small world networks, quick run. In, small, in small world networks, um, what you find is, is that you have short paths exist between any two people. You can, if, if you know how, you can get from any one person to any other person in a short number of steps, even if there are millions of people in the network. The challenge is that these short paths aren't necessarily easy to find. In the, in the case of, in the case of, uh, in the case of Milgram's experiment, people were able to use per information that they had about their friends, in effect, as signposts as to which of their friends they should send the letter to next. They knew that if one of their friends perhaps lived near Massachusetts, that they would be a good choice to forward the letter to if having reached that person, that person knew somebody who was close to the street or perhaps went to the same university as the intended recipient, they could send it on. So in, in social networks, people are able to use their knowledge of their friends as signposts for, root it, for finding these short paths. Well, the reason this works is that there is, people have a concept of similarity between other people. You know that if two guys live on the same street, they're likely to be more similar to each other and therefore more likely to, to be 
connected to each other than someone living out in Zimbabwe. So, so the, the algorithm is simple. Once you've got this concept of similarity, you simply route to the person that you know of that is closest to where you want to be at each step. We call this greedy routing. Freenet and distributed hash tables rely on this principle to find data in a scalable, decentralized way. So, so Ian just started by talking about the these peer-to-peer -peer networks and essentially the problem of the dark peer-to-peer -peer networks that we want to address. And then he talks about the small worlds and social networks forming small worlds. So what we want to talk about here today and what, this, we, what we're interested in is how can we apply this knowledge about small world and about these social networks to deal with these dark peer-to-peer -peer networks and try to make them more useful. And essentially, this starts with the realization that the dark net is just a social network. This dark net, the peer-to-peer -peer network that's formed when people connect only to people they trust, will be just this big encrypted network of people's relationships, just like the social networks that sociologists and people work with. So the, the environment that we're trying to deal with in our peer-to-peer -peer networks is just this social network that Milgram's experiment took place in and that we want to find a way to deal with. And we're interested, of course, always when we're trying to search in being able to find a way from one point to another in the network. We have this network that's large network connections going all over the place, and we need to find a way from one point to another. Well, we know that in the social network, and the dark net is like a social network, is a social network, we, people can find a way to go from one place to another. Milgram's experiment showed people can root in social networks, and they can do it well. He took only five or six steps to go from one side of this country to another, to a complete stranger. And people can do that. So if people can do it, then, well, so should computers. I mean, computers are much smarter than people, right? So to try to do this somehow, make computers do this, we need a, some sort of mathematical understanding for what's going on in a small world network. And this mathematical understanding has, is something rather recent, but a Cornell professor named John Kleinberg provided a model about five years ago that explains how these networks can look in order to be navigable. In order for it to be possible, as Ian said, to find signposts in the network that will take you where you want to go, it needs to have a certain configuration. And this configuration is um, that the possibility of being able to find routes efficiently from one point to another rests on the fact that you have people who have similarity to one another and, as Ian said, are more likely to be connected. And then you have a certain proportion of connections of different lengths with respect to some sort of position. And in the simplest model, position can just be where people live. And you say that people are more likely to be connected if they live close to one another. And as we get further away, we need this to be, uh, to the probability that people know each other, that they are connected, needs to decrease. And when this happens, that's when you can find an easy way to root in the network. So for our talk, we're actually going to allow people's positions to just be in a ring. And that doesn't mean that we think that people exist on a ring. But this is the very simplest model. We allow each person to just get a position on the ring, and then we see people knowing each other as these cords in the circle that skip over the people. So here I have two examples. We've placed these positions in a ring in the mathematical idealized model, and we say that there are two green people who know each other and two red people who know each other. But if you can see, the red one covers more of the circle. It's a longer link, therefore it needs to be less common. And according to Kleinberg's model, it needs to be these long links, which this one covers double as many steps along the edge here, so it needs to be half as common as the green one does. And if this is the case, if you have these connections, if we can put people into this base model with a circle or just a... And we have connections that agree with Kleinberg's model. We have some... Every once in a while, we run into a long connection. Somebody happens to know somebody who lives way on the other side of the world, but that's rather rare. More commonly, people know lots of people who live close to them, who are close to them, who are similar to them. If this is the case, and you have this model, then we can do this greedy routing that Ian describes, 
which just says, I'll always go to the, if I'm going to some destination, I always just step to the neighbor who's closest to my destination. And if I can do that in, in if, if, if the configuration of these friends is correct, then the greedy routing can be mathematically proved to perform in something on the order of log squared n steps. And when st something is log, that's good. If it's not log, it's bad. But we have log here, so that's going to help us. That means that we have an efficient way of finding steps from one way to another, which is exactly what we want if we want to be able to search and root in our dark peer-to-peer -peer network. So this is an example, a simulated example of how such a network would look. Now I've imagined again, I've just placed people's positions on a circle like this, or all around there are people placed on the circle. We have two red people who are circled at the end. And if you want to do a greedy route from one to the other, you simply follow these chords, which represent the friendships, and you try to get from one place to another by always choosing the friend who is closest to the destination. And so a route would look something like that. In the beginning, in the very first step, we can take a very long step because that takes us a lot closer to our destination. And as we get closer, it becomes harder and harder to find steps that take us a long way. But eventually, you do reach the destination and you do so in a bounded number of steps. But this is greedy routing, and this is on a circle. And I placed everyone on a circle in this imaginary world where it is extremely easy to find, to say, if you're closer to somebody than somebody else because you have a circle and you can say how many steps is it to him. But if we're trying to do greedy routing in a real social network, in the kind of social network that our darknet is going to form, we don't have an easy way of saying is one person closer to another. We end up having to answer questions like this. Is Alice closer to Harry than Bob? I'm trying to root in a social network. I'm this person in the Milgram experiment with the letter, and the letter is going to Harry. And I have to ask myself, should I send it to Alice or Bob? It has to, the letter has to go to Harry. I have to make a decision. Should I send it to Alice, or should I send it to Bob? Well, as a person, I make some sort of a judgment. And in Milgram's experiment, people have to make this judgment based on some idea of who of closeness between people. The most basic form would then be where do they live? If one of them, have, if Alice happens to be Harry's neighbor, then she is probably closer. There's a greater chance that they know each other than that Bob would know Harry. But you could also go on, for example, what their occupations are. People who are all hackers are more likely to have met at DEF CON than you know, somebody who's a nice dancer or something. So, um, but you could go, you know, jobs, interests. As a person, if you, we do these kind of dis, uh, judgments all the time, and it's not that hard for us to say what would be closer to one person than another. But now what we want to do is we have this dark net, which is this social network. We want to find a way to root, and we want a computer to do it. And in practice, we can't really ask the computer to make these decisions based on what people live, what they do, etc. I mean, actually... This isn't as insane as it may sound, because people have actually s tried this. And, and one can try to put into the computer as much personal information as the people as, as possible. And then you try to do some sort of closeness algorithm based on people's personal information, trying to match it so that you can make these routing decisions. And I know that, uh, and, and e but the fact is that what it has shown, even if you try to use a large number of criteria, computers are not good at making these sort of value judgments. And even more than that, what we're trying to build are anonymous file sharing networks, and they will not be a big hit if the first thing we do is ask everyone to put in all their personal information so that we can root. It just doesn't go over well with our target audience. So we have to find a different way to make these sort of answer these things with Alice, Harry, and Bob. Who is closer to who? And so the thing is, and this is what's extremely important, is the information is there in the network. We can let the network itself tell us who is closer to who. And we don't need to know anything about them except the network itself. We don't need to know where they live. We don't need to know what they do. All we need to do have is this network, and we work based on that. So how would we do this? Well, we have this model of John Kleinberg that tells us what should the world look like for it to be possible to greedy root efficiently. Well, what the world should look like is that there should be few long connections and many short ones. We, most people should be, most friends that you have should be close to one another, whereas you should once in a while have a long connection out to somebody who does it. And then, knowing this and having this graph, all we need to do is basically give people positions in a way so that this becomes true. We just say, 
we're, forget about the world, forget about where you live, forget about what you do, I don't care any about that. We're going to make believe, we're going to make positions for you based on the network and make it so that the properties that we are looking for are fulfilled. So what you can say is in a way, rather than taking the positions and trying to root on people's real positions in this sort of social space, we reverse engineer the positions of the people based on how the social network looks. And that is what allows us to give people new positions that we then can use to root. And once we have these positions, we can then do the simple greedy routing of always trying to go to the closest point and we get what we want. So, and the method to do this is actually surprisingly simple. There's some deep mathematical magic involved, but it actually turns out to be extremely simple. When people join the network, they simply choose a position that would be a position on this circle, and they do so in a random fashion. Everyone just decides, okay, do a random number generator, give yourself a position. And when you do that, of course, this is not going to be true, because two people who could be very close in some sense in the social network, of course, could have chosen positions at opposite ends, because it's completely random. In fact, they will choose positions at opposite ends. But then we have an algorithm where people get together and then they swap their positions with one another so as to minimize the product of the distances of the, to their friends. And this is extremely important and it has to do with the math. But they get together, they contact each other over the network and they say, I have position this, you have position that, maybe we'll just switch and we'll be better off. And this is an example of that sort of switch. These two people have chosen their positions randomly and so have their friends. And you have a green person who's got three green friends marked by these cords in the circle. And you have a red person who's got three red friends. But as it has been, since they chose their positions randomly, they happen to choose them on opposite sides of the network from their friends. And this is not what we're looking for. We're looking for something that fulfills this model that people who are, have lots of friends on one side, they should be on one side. Well, what if red and green were to swap positions with one another? Then we get something that looks like this. And this is much more in line with what we are looking for in our model. We have one or two long connections. We need some long connections. But mostly we have these short local connections so that people are close to the people that they are connected to. And so this is essentially the, the algorithm as it goes. It, I mean, there's some math involved and some formulas and stuff that I can give to the interested people. But essentially, people choose positions randomly and then they switch when it looks like switching will make this network more like what we're looking for. And some things to note is that this switching step is essential. We couldn't say, for instance, let's just have everyone choose a position and just take a position that's close to their neighbors. Because what happens if you do that is everyone ends up choosing the same position in the end. Once you've done it enough times, everyone's like, oh, I want to be closer to my neighbors, and they want to be closer, and it just converges on the same point. You get a bunch of people who are all saying that they're at the same point, and I promise you, you can't root based on that. So you need this random choice and then the switching back and forth. And, but, and one problem with this technique, of course, is that these identities that we use to root are going to be changing as people switch. And that's something that has to be dealt with at the application level because people do not have a permanent identity. But there are ways of going around this. As long as we have one way of finding paths from one path to another, one place to another, we can deal with the fact that people's identities may change. Okay, so now for the simulations. Uh, always a necessity to show that we've done some simulator data to show that this can actually work. And so what we have is three different modes here, which are essentially two controls and one good, and, and one sort of where we have applied our algorithm. The first control is the random route. If you start with a network, we have no positions whatsoever, and we're just looking to find a way of looking for data in this network. With no positions, no knowledge about anything, we can't do any form of greedy routing. All we can do is stumble around randomly and hope that we find our destination. So this is sort of the control of where you start out, the random network, the random search. That's all you can do. And the other control is going to be the completely idealized situation where we have created a network that agrees with this model according to some position scheme and we have this good network but known to perform in log squared time. This is where everything is good, but that's not the situation that we actually have. A situation that we actually have is something where we have a network just like this good one 
but we don't know anything about the positions and we have to use our algorithm to try to restore the positions. And that's what I have as the third data set will be the restored data. That will be our algorithm applied. So the first thing I'm going to do is show the success rate within these log n squared number of steps where n is the network size. You can see the size grows logarithmically there at the bottom up to about 256,000 I think for this data set. Um, and you can see that the random one falls off very fast. Random routing simply cannot perform in this number of steps. It fails to find data after it's, as the network grows. Whereas the good line will stay at the top. It always succeeds. The math tells us that it must. So it would only be a bug in my simulator if it wasn't. But this, um, and we can see that the restoring, applying our algorithm, doing these switches actually brings the success rate all the way up from the red line almost to the green line. And only at the very largest size do we see some significant deviation. But even at that level, we're talking about 96% success rate for the restored network. And the other thing one's interested in, of course, is the number of steps that it takes on average. And now we can see that even with the falling success rate, the successful queries in the random walk will increase as the size of the network grows dramatically. The good ones will stay low, just like the math tells us. And the restored one can bring us almost all the way down to an acceptable number of steps. But of course, that's simulated data. And, I've, and we started with the model that we're applying. And that's always a little suspect. I'm basically doing, making my, giving myself an idealized situation. So a more interesting question is, how do we do this if we have real world stuff? Well, so to get some real world stuff, rather than asking for permission, we simply borrowed some. And we went and grabbed 2,200 people from Orkut.com, which is this social networking site that, that Google started, I think, about a year and a half ago. Everyone ran, ran there because it was the, a fad or something and put in all their friends. And then no one's done anything with it. So I think, because it's, I, as far as I know, it's rather useless. But it, it does provide a very good data on social networks and how they look. So we grabbed some data from this and we spidered a set of people, starting with our friend Ian here, and, um, and, going and taking people so as to create a rather dense social network. Um, and as it happened, this was done rather randomly, but as it happened, and I guess that's not too surprisingly given maybe Ian's, uh, starting with Ian, but most of the people were programmers, techies, people in the technology community, and mostly Americans, very few non-Americans in the set. Um, and I think that I would imagine that say, maybe some of the people who are in this set are actually here today. Not just Ian, but somebody who was in it. And as just as a note, we got no Brazilians. If someone has logged into Orkut recently, you know that it's been overrun with Brazilians, because apparently in Brazil it's useful for something. So, so to say there are like 70 or 80 percent Brazilians there. But this set, apparently that social network is rather disconnected from this one. So our set contains programmers, Americans. There weren't a lot of these Brazilians who do whatever they do on Orkut. And just as a note, because when people talk about small worlds, they often talk about degree distributions and power laws. And we did have a degree dist power law degree distribution here in the sense that very f there were a couple of people, degree, when you talk about a degree in a network, you mean the number of people that somebody knows. So the most popular person here, and I think the most popular person in the set was Orkut Buykoken himself, the guy who founded the site. He had 289 friends in the set. So out of 2,000, he knew a hell of a lot of those people. And whereas most people had only around like 18, 20 neighbors there, as you can see. So this is the sort of power law degree distribution that can affect uh, the, the network. So dealing with this data set now, we want to apply this switching algorithm and hope that this will do something good, something that can beat just a random search. And a random search performs rather well on this data. And the reason that a random search performs well is that it will is because of this degree distribution. Because you run into people who know so many people, it's easy to run into the person that you're looking for. So with power laws, it tends to perform rather well. So in this log n squared steps, and I, you should all be able to do that in your heads, but 2,000 log n squared, that's about 120 something, right? So in about 120 steps, the success rate was 72. And of the successful ones, it was about 43. So for randomly searching a network of 2,000, this is rather good. 
So the question, of course, is if we run the switching, try to apply this. This is a real social network. Can we just get somewhere with this greedy routing by assigning identities? And the answer is yes. So with our algorithm, we can search with a 97% success rate in this data, and on the mean number of steps is only about 7.7. .7. So we are rather happy with that result because it really shows that we can massacre the random search by performing this ordering, and we can get something that actually seems, it actually looks like the social network lives up to the model and what we were looking for. And one, person, one thing one can see is that this degree distribution, the fact that there are people who know many people, can affect the results. So if we clip the degree distribution, meaning I don't allow anybody to have more than 40 friends, I just throw away everybody's friends after 40, we can look, was this the, what was actually going on? And in the random search, you can see that, yes, in this case, success rate falls dramatically because you don't have these people who know tons of people. But in the case of our thing, it adds a couple of steps, but the success rate is still good, and it's still dramatically better than the random search. So we can say that our algorithm can take advantage of this degree distribution, but it was not use it. And it seems like it actually does work. Starting with a social network, you can reverse engineer positions so as to make it possible for a computer to do what people will do when they're trying to pass a letter along based purely on this stuff. So we're going to go with the demo? Yeah. So to demonstrate this, we were going to show routing in this, um, so between some people in this data set from Orkut. So one thing to start with um, is, um, is go starting from Ian himself, who was of course the start of our set, and going to, for instance, Sergey Brin, who I think we all know, Ian wants to know how many steps does Sergey bring because I want to borrow some money or something. So, and they will actually search the set and you can see that it skips from friend to friend and finds a path from Ian to James in four steps. And what's, what, what needs to be noted about this is that when this does the search, it does it in a decentralized fashion. It never looks at anything at any step except who your friends are and it decides which of Ian's friends was closest to Sergey Brin. Which of Sean Parker's friends was closest to Sergey Brin? And then so when it gets to James Joachim, it finds that he knows Sergey Brin. So the search is completed. Another example, we could do person in the set number 1708. I hope I can read my own handwriting here. Which is Fyodor, who I think is at the conference somewhere. And we could go from him to now somebody else who's in the set, like Lawrence Lessig. And that one also succeeds. And you can see how we are honing in in these positions in the circle, always choosing the friend of Fyodor who was closest and then the closest. And it actually has managed to assign these positions in a way that it can find this path going in. So well, one other interesting thing, just, just while we have this tool that, that we discovered, is that there are certain people in this data set who aren't well, they are real people, but, but it's kind of an abuse of the system. So, for example, you get celebrities or politicians, one example being John Kerry, who someone signed up as John Kerry, and then people will connect to that person, I guess, to show that they, they're going to vote for him or something. But, but the interesting thing about people like John Kerry in this data set is that they don't fit in to this, uh, they don't fit into this small world model. If you've just got random people connecting to you, then it doesn't fulfill this criteria for a small world whereby to, if, you know, if you know somebody and you know somebody else, then they're more likely to know each other. So if, let's say, we try to route from Sergey Brin to the fake John Kerry, the results are, are kind of interesting, and, and, and what, you, what you actually find is that this will, this will keep going for 200 steps and never, never actually succeed in finding John Kerry. And, and again, that, the reason for that is very simply that this John Kerry user does not fit in to the social network model that, that we assume. 
Yeah, be- because he he doesn't actually know the people that are connected to him. Indeed, you know they don't know him either. So I can. S- so. So, that's kind of the the theory, and I. I hope we've, kind of, we've demonstrated through simulation, including a simulation on real-world data, that uh, this, this idea can, can actually work. So, just real quick, I uh, should talk about some of the practical concerns. We're actually implementing this right now. Uh, we, uh, we're about three weeks into coding, and we hope to have a prototype of it in, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, hang on, this has gone mad. Okay. Um, so, theory works. What, what are the concerns in, in practice? Well, preventing malicious behavior, obviously. This Freenet is, is the type of peer-to-peer software that expects to be attacked. And therefore, it's essential that, you, it is, it's essential that one person cannot easily take down the network or otherwise uh, make themselves a nuisance. It's essential that it's easy to use. This is, this is a problem that Freenet has certainly experienced, but right, right back for the past two decades of security software, including, for example, PGP, people have always found that when you create a really cool piece of software that does something really cool in terms of anonymity, privacy, or you know, other kind of crypto stuff, People just don't use it, or at least mo- it doesn't achieve wide adoption because it's just too difficult to use. Uh, with with this next iteration of Freenet, we really want to we really want to tackle that head on. So we need to think about how do we actually make this thing usable. Um, additionally, how is how is data going to be stored in this architecture? And, and perhaps maybe it can do other things other than just storing and retrieving data as Freenet currently does. So preventing malicious behavior, what, what, are, what are the threats? Well, somebody could potentially select an identity to attract certain types of data or otherwise act maliciously. They could potentially through a similar means manipulate the identities of other nodes for some nefarious purpose. How do we ensure ease of use? Well, one requirement is that peers will need to be, or at least most peers will need to be always on. That's not so much of an issue now that uh, broadband is, is, is better deployed and is being deployed so quickly. How do we introduce peers? Uh, can we do it by email? kind of a PGP style thing where you have a block of data that you can cut and paste into Freenet and that can facilitate introduction. Maybe you can do it by phone, verbally phoning up your friend and saying, hey, let's do this. Here's the kind of code number uh, to allow us to connect to each other securely. Or maybe you're willing, maybe you've got a lower uh, threshold and you're willing to trust some third party to negotiate this introduction. What about NATs and firewalls? One of the big problems that peer-to-peer has experienced over the past few years is that peer, with peer-to-peer, it's essential that people can make incoming connections to your peer, and NATs and firewalls make that a lot more difficult. Fortunately, people have developed techniques to get around that, but that adds challenges in terms of peer introduction. So we can use UDP hole punching as kind of a increasingly standardized way to achieve that. It's used by Digger, another one of my projects, and uh, Skype. Um, but that would require a third party for, for negotiation. Okay. So in, in conclusion, real quick, so we have time for a few questions. Um, we believe that this is not only possible, we're going to do it, and we are doing it. There's still a lot of work to do on the theory. In other words, you know, can other models work better? In particular, right now, when nodes are when nodes choose each other, other to decide whether swapping would be advantageous, they do so at random. That's kind of nice for some of the mathematics that we haven't really discussed for lack of time, but it it, it may mean that it's not it it doesn't converge to a good network as quickly as it could. So we need to explore perhaps a more directed search for peers to swap with. 
Um, and it needs, it needs, like everything, it needs to be tested on more data. We've learned the hard way that practice is more difficult than theory, particularly with, with Freenet. Security issues clearly, clearly are critical. That's one of our, our major focuses. And deployment of the network, it, you know, we could come up with the coolest thing in the world that's ultra secure. If it's not easy to use, we'll get 10 users and it won't be useful to anyone. So if you're interested in uh, participating, helping Freenet, if you don't know, it's an open source project where uh, we try to be very open to people who are uh, willing and able to make a contribution. So if this interests you, our website is uh, Freenet freenetproject.org and Oscar insists that I show you this slide. So um, I guess we, we, have, uh, we have about five minutes for, uh, for some questions if we have any. Yes, here at the front. So, so the question was, what is the incentive for um, people to acquire a lot of neighbors? Well, well, the incentive is actually quite simple. The more neighbors you have, the, the better connected to the network you are, and therefore you'll be able to find and retrieve data more quickly. If you, let's say you've only got one connection to the network, chances are they're on an ADSL broadband line they've got perhaps 10 or 20 kilobytes per second upstream. If you want to download something and you're just relying on one person, that's going to place a serious limit on, on the speed with which you can do that. So do you want to No, I comment? just wanted to say it is an extremely important question that needs to be addressed because you really do need people to have a lot of friends. If everyone just connects to one person, you get a network that's one long string and you're not going to get anywhere. So you're right, and that has to do with this when we're talking about ease of use, that how we deploy this, how we get people to install it, and what they do right afterwards is really going to affect whether it can work or not. So it's something that one needs to be very careful with. And yeah, this is the insane part about trying to write these networks which rely on these emergent effects, that some of it is out of our hands. It's not like deploying normal software. We just write software that works. We actually need people to use it in the right way. But, you know... I don't think we've gotten there. Uh, well, are you disconnected, basically? Yeah, you, you basically, you would just disconnect for them, from them at that point. I mean, you can, you know, you can, you can uh, shut down relationships just as quickly as you can, as you can start them up. And, and also, I'm, I mean, there are lots of these trust issues. Like, for instance, you could want, you could want to deal with People who are less paranoid might want to allow for a friend of a friend connection so as to speed the network up and stuff like that. So, so if I can, if I can kind of address your core point because no one else can hear you. So, um, so I think your core question was: um, we make the assumption that shorter paths are almost always better, and so and in this we've ignored the fact that some people are on modems, some people are on fast ADSL connections, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a good point. We haven't discussed that, but we have actually considered that. Um, what the approach, that, the approach that we're considering in order to address that issue is, in effect, a you, you split up the friends that you're connected to into several groups. Let's say it's two groups for simplicity. You have your fast friends and your slow friends. So the, the top 50% who's faster 
the bottom 50% who's slower. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is, you don't you don't slot them into fixed categories. You can you can adapt that as time goes on. And then when you root, when you start out rooting, you basically you want to you want to try and find it from your fast friends first. So when you initiate a request, you will send it to your faster friends, and uh, you know if that fails to find it, then you resort to your slower friends. I'm sorry, I can't. Don't really have time to give a, a more in-depth explanation. Well, well, uh, that it, I mean that that is one of the dangers. People trying to manipulate the network with fraudulent swap requests. And there are a variety of ways that, that you can mitigate. There are a variety of ways you can mitigate it. One one example would be well, I don't really have time to go into it, but we've we have thought about a technique that's a variation on how uh, you can do secure group random number generation. So basically, get someone to cryptographically commit to a certain range. Well, I can't really explain it in the time available, but we'll we'll talk later. Um, any, I, I think we're we're just we're just done. One one more question. Right. Well, I mean that that is in effect up to users' self-interest. Um, it is in users' self-interest to trust the people that they're connecting to, and as as such, we would our hypothesis is that they will tend to form a social network. It so happens that the criteria to for a structured network to work here are actually pretty robust. Um, you don't. It doesn't demand that you have exactly the one over distance distribution that Kleinberg suggested. It's actually very, very robust. And beyond that, addressing the issue you require, you, while you're saying the John Kerry problem, in many ways that's kind of a usability issue, steering people towards a certain model of usage of the software just in terms of how it interacts with, with users. I'm afraid we're going to have to end it there. Thank you. We'll talk about that.